Um, also, another observation we were, as um, Brother Claude was sharing about his father, Brother Wayne will be turning 90, Lord willing, in, in October. And I was commenting with Gail that I would like to see him make that. He, he, he's already been telling me he's 90, so that's how bad he wants to be 90. And so he's, we're just praying for strength and for comfort. I know he really wants to make that 90-year-old mark. And, and so I don't know if we're allowed to pray the, about that kind of stuff, but that's kind of what's on my heart, that God would give him that. He, he um, just seems like 90 is a big, big deal for him. Well, we, um, on Monday, this coming Monday is the first Monday of September, and it's a very significant day. What day is it? Labor Day, and um, I wanted to take a break from the series that we're in just to talk a little bit about God's Labor Day, and, and, and mind you, I'm having a play on words there, and hopefully you will understand at the end of the sermon, but um, I was expecting a smaller crowd because people are warning me. You're, a lot of people are leaving out of town and all that. But I'm glad to see all of you here. We, we have a much bigger crowd than what I expected for Labor Day. And today is potluck day. So that's something to be celebrating as well. So look, Isaac's already going for it. Who, who, he's, he's, um, I also am that way with potluck. And by the way, you men that like, or women too, if you like some hot salsa, and you get some chicken. I got some really good salsa for you for potluck. So um, some have already tried it, and, and I hope they liked it. I want to read a little bit here about Labor Day. Um, do you kind of a trivia type of thing? Um, see how well you know about Labor Day. What state was the first state to pass Labor Day? Any any idea? Just throw out an New York City. That's close, and I'm at, we'll come back to that. But it, the first state to pass on February 21st, 1887, was Oregon. That was the first one to pass a law. Okay. Um, before that time, there were some what they called municipal, you know, just the local ordinances that were passing that passed during 1885 and 1886. The first state bill was introduced in New York as a legislator, but it, but it was an organ that beat them to the punch as far as making it a law. And then after that, during the, the year, four more states. Can you take a guess of what four states? They're actually kind of spread out across the United States. Actually, one is over in this way and three is on the other side of the country. Take a guess. The one this way is Colorado. The one on the other side, the three on the other side, were new, or the other two were New York, um, sorry, Massachusetts, New, new Jersey, and New York. They were the ones that passed in that same year. And they created the Labor Day holiday by legislative enactment. So it made it, it's a law. You need to take a break. And they're like, well, thank you. We appreciate that kind of law. By 1894, 23 other states had adopted the holiday. And before even that happened, there were states like Connecticut, Nebraska, and Pennsylvania that followed suit. So it was pretty quickly people were catching on and states were catching on. I think everybody, nobody argues against legislation to take a break, right? And on June 28th of that year, Congress passed, this is 1894, Congress passed an act making the first Monday in September of each year a legal holiday in the District of Columbia and the territories. Of course, they're not going to, what we wish the federal government would do now is just leave the states alone, let them make their own decisions. But they're at least saying, okay, we're going to make it part of the federal district, that's Washington, D.C., and all the territories because Congress was in charge of the territories. But the states themselves came out with it. And... Going back to what Evie says, it was on Tuesday. The very first Labor Day holiday was celebrated on Tuesday, September 5th. Now, it wasn't a Monday because it hadn't been made law the, the first Monday. Tuesday, September 5th, 1882 in New York City. So she was right. And um, one of the mentioned, there was two men that they, they divided on who came up with the idea of Labor Day. 
Whose idea was it? Who's the real father of Labor Day? And um, the first one was Peter McGuire. Then there was another guy named Matthew McGuire. Totally different. Just a coincidence. Their names are spelled differently. Um, Peter McGuire is M-C-G-U-I-R-E. And Matthew McGuire is M-A-G-U-I-R-E. So it's just a little bit different spelling. Not related to each other, but it's argued who was the first father of Labor Day. And I, and I want to read just this one last part before we go into the message. And it was a nationwide holiday. The form that the observation and celebration of Labor Day should take was outlined in the first proposal of the holiday. And guess what? Well, the very first thing that they thought of for Labor Day. What is it? What we know Labor Day for? Parade. Exactly. Parades. So they were a parade, a street parade to exhibit to the public the strength and esprit de corps of the trade and labor organizations. Our president couldn't say, I almost said it like our president, our corpse, but it's not, it's core. Of organizations of the community, followed by a festival for the recreation and amusement of the workers and their families. This became the pattern for the celebrations of Labor Day. Speeches by prominent men and women were introduced later as more emphasis was placed upon the economic and civic in significance of the holiday. Still later, by the resolution of the American Federation of Labor Convention in 1909, the Sunday preceding Labor Day was adopted as Labor Sunday and dedicated to the spiritual and educational aspects of the labor movement. It was a day to celebrate that God has blessed us with jobs and things to do. And it was a time that the, U the U.S. is coming together, celebrating their strength, celebrating the blessings that we have, that we have jobs and we're able to move forward. And something we need to remember now even more. I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles to John chapter 6. I want to talk a little bit about a different kind of labor, and maybe we could say a different kind of labor day, but not in the sense of 24-hour day, labor day. John chapter 6. And I'm going to pick up reading in verse 22. John chapter 6, 22. I hope... Um, Maybe you took the time to read the scripture reading. So, because sometimes the scripture reading is usually part of what the main text is, but it's just a little bit that brings out the main point. And you'll, you'll catch that when we get to verse 27, 28, and 29. And that's usually why I like to ask. I forget sometimes to ask our MCs. But in general, I would like for the MCs, and this is just a note for MCs, if you would read the scripture reading. So it gets our mind a little bit on the main point. John chapter 6, we're going to pick up in verse 22. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save the one wherein to his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that that the Lord had given thanks. And when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum and seek for Jesus. And by the way, that just meant they got in their boats and started following, okay? Verse 25, and when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when comest thou hither? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Verse 27, this is where the, the scripture reading begins. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that, which, that meat which endureth unto for everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Verse 28, And then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto him, This is the work of God. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. That ends the scripture reading. Verse 30, and they said, therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee, but what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna 
in the desert as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I, said unto, but I said unto you that you also have seen me and believe not. But all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Very reminiscent of what John writes in John chapter 3, 16. You know that scripture verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the, world, through the Son the world might be saved. John is speaking, and if you recall what's going on in this storyline, earlier on in the chapter 6 is John's own version of the feeding of the 5,000. What I like about John is he's different from the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When they would record, and they record, Matthew says it was on a mountain. And we're told that as they're feeding and, and they're probably in the just sharing this food with people remember um, the disciples had come to him and said we need to let the people go so they can go find food I had done a sermon way back when and preached a couple times when it said you give them something to eat he, he challenges the disciples don't send them off they'll make, well, we don't have enough money it's going to take a year's wages to spend for all these people but John takes a different approach as he records this in John chapter 6. But the thing I like about this is when, and I use this as part of the, my understanding of ministry. We do a lot, and I believe a lot, in using social gospel. But a social gospel, if you don't know what social gospel means, is where you minister to people in the community by helping them in their needs. The rescue mission, the Thanksgiving program. But that's only to get our foot in the door because there's a bigger issue that we have to take care of. And it's from this scripture from John chapter 6 when Jesus says, and this is where the story began, what we began reading, that as John records Jesus, as they, he had gone to pray and now he's caught up with his disciples and he has gotten a boat with them and people are amazed. How did you get over here? And he's, he, he goes right to the point. You guys are only looking for me because you want that physical bread. There's more important things. That's when he says in verse 26, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles. You know why Jesus did miracles, what John tells us he did? First and foremost, because his disciples began to believe. The very first, I would say, miracle, miraculous thing that happened wasn't just the, the, the wedding at Cana. That was his first miracle that he performed when he told Nathaniel. Nathaniel was probably a deep, deep student of the Bible. And by the way, Nathaniel in the other Gospels is called Bartholomew. Nathaniel sitting there, and his friend Philip comes and says, Hey, we found the Messiah. And he mentions that Jesus comes from Nazareth, and he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So already, he's already thinking, oh, how could this be? But all Jesus needed to say was, now this is a man. He's a true Israelite. He de he's not deceived. He's not someone who deceives people. He's not a pretender. Nathaniel says, how do you know me? I believe Nathaniel was probably the, the theologian. He was the Bible student amongst the group. The other ones were fishermen. 
by the way, I made this comment not too long ago. To whom was Jesus speaking when he said, I will make you fishers of men? To all the disciples? He said it to four men. Peter and Andrew, James and John. Come follow me. Because he was using a point, using their, their thing. And, and, and I remember I mentioned this to somebody a couple weeks ago. Um, we, we sang the song, Bringing in the Sheaves. You remember that, Brother Leroy led us in that? I said, how, how would we say that in our vernacular? How would you say it in our day? And it said, oh, we're bailing the hay, bailing all the hay. I don't know how we could get that rhyme. Now the farmers here go, oh, now I get it. I, God wants us to do that. He wants the fishermen to fish for men. He wants the farmers to not just work on crops, but to bring in the sheaves or bale the hay or however we want to put it. What was that? And Nathaniel, he says, I saw you when you were under the fig tree because traditionally that's where students of the Bible would do. They could leave their hot house where it's cooking's going on and the house is baking, especially during the hot part of the year. And they would go sit, un sit under a fig tree to study. Have you ever seen a fig tree that got huge leaves? And he was studying. He says, I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathaniel says, you are the king of Israel. You are the holy one. And Jesus says, wow, that fast you believe in me? Wow, you're going to see greater things than this. The miracles that Jesus was doing was to, first of all, to help his disciples. But it was also to show the people that he was the one that God had called. He was the one that he was sent So he says here, in verse 26, You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. And reading verse 27 again, he says, Labor not for the meat which perishes. Don't, don't spend all our time. Remember he says that on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, chapter 5 through, through 7. And it's actually particularly we can find it in chapter 6 when he says everybody else in the world is worried about what they're going to eat and drink and what clothes they're going to wear and all this. God will take care of that. You seek the kingdom of God first. And all those other things will be added to you, he tells the people. He gave the examples of, of the flowers and the birds. Look how God takes care of them. And he will take care of you because you're worth more than that. When he says here, labor not. And then they ask him, what do we need to do? What does God want us to do? What is the work that we're supposed to do? What was his answer? You would expect him to say, well, you need to do a few things and do these activities. And No, he wants you to believe. And not just believe in general. Believe on the one that was sent. See, the disciples did that. When I go through the book of John, there's two questions that we answer as we're going. I'm working with a young man right now. And we're studying John, and I'm amazed how quickly he's already picked up on it before I'm even there. We're, I'm telling him he's already had studied ahead, and he's already figured it out. But the two questions that we brought out was, who is Jesus? Because it's important to know who he is. And what does he want from me? What does it mean to be a disciple? These people are asking that question. What is it, the work of God that we need to do? John, it's not the only time that he mentions this. Turn with me to 1 John. We're going to come back here to John. But 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, we're going to read from verse 18 and go to verse 24. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now the main point is not brought out of this section, but the context helps us kind of get the big picture of what John is saying. And hereby we know that we are the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. That's a great thing. 
when we're when in our conscience and our heart we feel like we're doing the right thing that's a great place to be in but even if our hearts are condemning us God is greater than that even and we continue and whatsoever we ask we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do these things that are pleasing in his sight and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of, of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he had given us. You know, sometimes you've probably heard this term. It's called easy believism or cheap grace, some people will call it. I like how one minister said, he said, there's nothing cheap about grace. If somebody has easy believism, it's because they haven't understood and they don't know Jesus. They just think that somehow God just kind of magically just said, ah, forget about all those bad things you did. No, he paid a high price for that. Because God knows that there's a certain order of our belief and of our walk in Christ. He knows that when we're like Nathaniel, when we're like the other disciples and we say, you're the Holy One. I want to follow you. When we're like Peter, who when he says, he says, will you lead me also? In the same, very, very same book in John. And Peter says, where are we going to go? You're the one who has the words of eternal life. He knows that when we have that understanding in us, then we say, I believe you and I want to follow you. I'm your disciple and I will emulate you because what you have, I want to have. And there's a certain order to it. I want to direct your attention to 2 Corinthians, if you turn with me. To 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 17. I'm going to read these verses and then I'm going to give a little bit of contextual background. Verse 17 says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changing into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. You know, I think it's interesting because the Apostle Paul, as he's writing the Corinthians, remember, these were those guys that, that they were kind of, they're having difficulties in church. You think sometimes we could have difficulties. They were having some, they were pretty divided on things. But Paul took a high road with them and thought very highly of them. He knew where to, to tell them where they needed to work on. But he never once ever said, oh, you guys, you know, you're just lucky that God hasn't destroyed you. Never that attitude. And a matter of fact, in the second letter, actually the fourth letter to the Corinthians, the second letter in our Bible, he's trying to help them understand his feeling for them as opposed to all the false teachers that were in their lives trying to tell them something different. He starts out this chapter telling them that, that you guys, just the very fact that what God is doing in your life shows that you are letters. We don't need somebody to, I don't need to walk around with a diploma and all that to show. I can show, point at you out and people will see God working and, and how he has blessed our ministry. That's what he tells the Corinthians, basically. Tells them that they're, he says they're not written in ink on rolls or on stone, but on fleshly tablets of the heart. Because of this, he trusts his ministry, his calling. He sees how God has made them sufficient. He's, he's made them capable. My life verse is this verse 6 of chapter Two, three of Corinthians, Second Corinthians, who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, the New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. That's the way I want to. That's what I want my ministry to be like, is one that brings life. Doesn't mean there's not admonition. There's, there's moments of you have to point out things or address areas. 
The reason why this is important, because when we get back to verse 17, see, the Jews didn't get it at the time. Only a few did, the remnant. They began to understand. They began to follow Jesus. The first 12 of them, minus one, followed Jesus, and they got it. And they began to emulate him. The rest of them, it says, it was like a veil being over their eyes, just like with Moses when he had to cover his face. And he's quoting from Exodus chapter 34. He says they're, they're following after, and they're, when they read Moses, when they're looking at these things, they still don't get it. But the ones who got it is because their hearts turned to the Lord. Verse 16 tells us that. The veil shall be taken away. And now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And he ends this by saying, we will be changed into his likeness. Because we're watching the master. We're emulating him. We're being changed. The Holy Spirit is working in us. See, there's a certain little simple formula or process that's going on here. First, we have Jesus. We say, yes, he's the Messiah. He's the one. He's the son of God. He's the promised one. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. We can go on and on. We make that declaration. We believe in him. He is the Lord. He is the one Lord. And then he promises his Holy Spirit, which does the work in us to begin to change us into his likeness. And we begin to look more like Jesus as time goes by. I have an observation to make here. I've oftentimes, all my life, as all, most of you, growing up in our background of the church and our doctrinal, our doctrines, and especially the Sabbath, are things that we speak about. But it, it seems like we talk more about that, especially the Sabbath, than we do about Jesus himself. There are many people throughout my years, especially as a pastor, and noting more and more that it's more common that I would hear about those type of things. And I don't hear them speaking about Christ and who Christ is in their life and how they, someone else needs Christ. And, and I, I get it. I understand it. I understand doctrine. I understand all of it. I believe it. I had a story, and I've shared this before, about my uncle Trini Padilla, who was a minister for many years. And he would walk, and one time he was on a park bench. My mom had shared this with me. He was on this park bench, and this lady sat next, an elderly woman sat next to him. I don't know why I think of Sister Opal. <laughs> I, I almost could see myself as my uncle Trini and Sister Opal would come and sit next to me. Sorry, Sister Opal, if I use you as an example. but. And I, and I would be sitting, this is my Uncle Trini, looking at this elderly woman and saying, I'm a minister of the gospel, the Church of God, Seventh Day, with, you know, and we're part of the true church, or I don't know what he was saying, but, you know, and saying, and I, the, 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 the Seventh Day Sabbath, the, the true Sabbath, and et cetera, et cetera. And he named off a few different things that we believe are distinctives. And then the sweet old lady just looked at him and said, that's nice, dear. Do you know Jesus? <laughs> See, the Jews had all that as well. They had all those things, and they still had a veil over their face. They still were like with Moses, that glory, because they, the glory of one thing, they, wouldn't, they couldn't understand to let that glory pass and take the glory of the Lord himself, because that's what this is about. Brethren, we can defend the Sabbath. We're really good at that. We can honor the Sabbath. And we can, I, I really like to look at it as saying, I receive it as a gift. Receive the blessing of the Sabbath. But it's more important to me to honor the Lord of the Sabbath. The Bible says in Mark chapter 2. And he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also, even. And he's Lord of the Sabbath. 
I want to give honor where honor is due. Because I believe that is the key to our growing. If we get things out of order, we're not going to grow spiritually. We might think we are. And here's a saying of Jesus himself, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Something I need to understand as well and take, take care. I want to wrap up with just another verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This just a few verses or a few chapters away. And I want to read these two verses and just a quick explanation so we can wrap up here. We then, as workers together with him, this is the Apostle Paul writing, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. That means I have helped thee. I've, I've come to your rescue. I've, I've done these things for you. Behold, now is accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know the beauty of this? And this is where the day, this is how I kind of mixed up the, brought in labor and day together. Because it all has to do around a certain thing. What is the labor? What is the work that God wants? To believe on his son. Because if we get that right, everything else will fall in place. Do you agree with me on that? Then say amen, please. If you don't agree, I hope you'll get it someday. Because I'm speaking truth. It's not easy believism. The quotation that Paul is taking is from Isaiah chapter 49 verse 8. And it's interesting when I did the comparison and I did some more study on it and compared that he's actually literally quoting from the Greek Septuagint. I have it right here in my notes. I copied both of them. The Greek text of the Old Testament and the Greek text in the New Testament are the exact same in that quote. And it's very interesting, though, when, when Paul repeats himself, he says, he, when he quotes in verse 2, he says, now, he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation, I have secured thee. And by the way, these are references to Jesus, the Father and the Son speaking. Behold, now is the accepted time. The word in the Greek, in the first quote, when Paul repeats it, he, he gives a bigger word. I know you don't like it when I read Greek words, but it, I have to say this. Dektos is the, the original word, and it means a person or thing who has been regarded favorably. A person or thing who has been regarded favorably. That speaks volumes by itself. God is speaking favorably. Now is the extent of time. The time is still open. I'm, I'm ready to receive you. Believe. Believe on my son is what he's saying. Comes from the Greek verb, which is dekomai, and it means a deliberate and ready reception of what is offered. Think of a, a, a sacrifice or an offering. You say, Lord, this is for you. And God says, I receive it. But he's telling them God is offering something to people and they accept it. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. But when Paul repeats it later on in this verse, chapter 6, verse 2, he uses the, the word eprodectos. It's a stronger form of the dectos. It means a very favorable acceptance. It goes beyond just saying, yeah, I accept you. He accepts you. That's the day of his salvation. I'd like to ask you to stand. And when we think of Labor Day, maybe it might trigger this message. I know you go home and you forget the message, and, and frankly, so do I. Not all the time. I, I, I have folders and folders. I keep my messages and stuff, but... Um, but the application is always harder. But just remember this. When we're really asking God, what is it you want me to do? 
He says, believe in my son. Why? Because everything is going to fall into place that way. But we're not just laborers in that sense of receiving Christ. We're also laborers in getting other people to do that. That's the other part of the labor that we have. So when we look at God's labor day, that's what comes to mind. God wants me to believe in his son, and he wants me to, to work at bringing people to come and know his son as well. Because things will fall in place. Bow your heads with me. Father, we come before you. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord. You have been good to us, and we don't deserve anything. As good as we can get, and there are some really good people in here, Father, that by themselves they are not able to. And it's only because of your mercy and grace in our lives, Lord, that you are. You reach out to us, and you've given us a time of acceptance. And that time is still ongoing, even though there may be some here that just say, no, I'm not ready for that yet. Lord, none of us have day, our days guaranteed. But the time is still there. You are still re receiving people in spite of all the things that are going on in our world. All the how things are changing very quickly. You still are receiving people to you. Now is the accepted time, a time of great favor. If we just place our trust in your son, Jesus. And on the same token, Father, we need help as believers, those of us who are believers here, to help others come to that understanding, to be able to preach boldly that message of Christ and their need for Christ. We ask you that we spend our time working at that and laboring at that, be with our fellowship as we go from here and help us to remind ourselves of these words. Give us your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us and to change us. John tells us that the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin. Lord, but the Holy Spirit is to lead us, Father, into all righteousness. We thank you and we bless your holy name. And Father, we just thank you for the food we're going to share together. Bless all those who took the time this week to prepare and to have it ready, Father. And all those who are fellowshipping, be with us. Be with um, Patrick and Sophia as they have found a, a food that's more important than just having potluck, Lord. They're ministering. We ask you to bless their efforts. We thank you and for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. Thank you, Pastor Monaco, and uh, bringing your message of the Lord to us today. I invite you all to open your hymn books to page 231. Sing to the work. Page 231. To the work we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master has trod. With the balm of his counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope, let us watch and labor till the Master comes. To the work, to the work, let the hungry be fed. To the fountain of life, let the weary be led. In the cross and its banner, our glory shall be. While we herald the tidings, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the Master comes. Do 
the work, to the work, there is labor for all. For the kingdom of darkness and error shall fall. And the name of Jehovah exalted shall be in the loud swelling chorus salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the Master comes. To the work, to the work, in the strength of the Lord, and a robe and a crown shall our labor reward. When the home of the faithful our dwelling shall be, and we shout with the ransom, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the Master comes. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love that uh, you had you have for us and that you gave your son to die for our sins that we have a home in your kingdom and we pray lord that you would help each and every one of us to be uh picking up our our role and our responsibilities as uh laborers in your um in your workforce taking our place and uh sharing your love to those around us preaching the message that salvation is free for all those that do not know you, that they might come to accept you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, we ask that you'd guide and direct us in each and every day, that we would always not be lazy, but be a diligent worker for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.